we're not very good at scaling our ethics with our technology, which is really inconvenient. Hello, my fellow avid readers. Welcome to Read Between the Lines, where we take you behind the cover and between the lines of our favorite books, and we hope yours too. Today, we're talking about Where's My Flying Car, a futurism novel by J. Story Hall, which we have some uh, strong opinions about, but we'll get into those a little bit uh, a little bit later. And speaking of we, I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Squid from the Depths Key. Squid, why don't you tell him hello? Happy to be here. Excited to talk about this book. I'm excited too. I think that it it's different than a lot of the books we've had, mostly because both of us um, have had a visceral reaction to some of his. I don't know. That's that's not fair. We had well, a, that's fair because I feel like. I feel like most of the time it's either one of us likes the book, the other one hates it, or we're both pretty neutral about it, or we both kind of love it. And that's not the case for this one at all. Before we get into it, um, so you chose this book, and uh, I think I know the answer, but do you mind sharing with the audience uh, how we ended up reading this book? So I'll be honest, the cover art is beautiful. Like, wow. Like, whatever graphics team put this book together, they did a great job. Because the, I mean, the, the the book on the shelf looks it looks like I want to figure out what that book is about and then also the description is very very telling it's very very intriguing um, but it didn't really follow through on it uh, it's a bit of a random choice if I remember correctly you because we were discussing what books we should do next week and you told me um, you know what, let me plan a little bit more this time. Because last time, I randomly chose a book from my shelf, and that's how we ended up with Where's My Flying Car. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, I agree. I think, um, you know, read this book if you are the kind of person that likes deep speculation about, you know, possible futures. And uh, the tone of a professor who got his funding pulled. Because that's that's definitely the vibe that I got from this whole book. I always think when I'm starting to give a negative review, and heads up, spoiler alert, this will be a, a pretty heavily skewing towards negative review of this book. Um, I'm always worried of like, what if they see this? What if of the 10 people that watch this show, someone knows the author and sends it to him? And I'm like, well... If I get eviscerated by this man, I guess I'm just going to have to deal with that. Yeah, but to be fair is I I do have a real real appreciation for the work that went into building this book because his sources and references and information he pulls are really well put together, right? He did a really good job of going through and getting his and his numbers and stuff and that kind of thing. And I think that's the hardest thing about giving him a negative review is saying like yeah. is is seeing all the work he put in and then and then being like I don't, I is it because I'm not a scientist? Is it because I'm not a sciencey person? I'm a I'm a dumb dumb theater person, so I don't really get the I don't really get all of the technological kind of advances that he has this dream vision of. Or I'm a sciencey person, like I suppose I'm a sciencey person. All signs point to it. Um, and uh, I don't know. It's this how his tone lapses in and out of like it doesn't stay true. Like, hey, this is interesting from a pretty technical perspective. He gets going. And you're like, okay, I'm vibing with this. Yeah, tell me about some cool shit. And then he gets on a rant. Mm. Like a page and a half, right? And if he, if he yeah. had exercised a little more restraint, I think, on getting into those rants, I think the value of this book would have been able to really support the work he did on pulling together his research much more accurately. I completely agree. I think his tone ruined it for me. It was this tone of derision towards what we've accomplished and a lack of gratitude for the growth that we've had could because he was so focused on what we didn't. You know, he, he yeah. discounted the benefits of the technological advances we've had in telecommunication and what he deemed as low energy pursuits. And he like almost demonized them. Like, how dare you take the research and the time and the effort away from um, more more worthy pursuits like a flying car 
I do think he made great points about how like regulation and external factors played into why we don't have a flying car. Like I think I think those are really cool. I think uh, I think we should start off by kind of going into what do you what was the most surprising thing to you, Squid, about his analysis on why we don't have a flying car? Two different things here. My most surprising thing about this book, and as far as why we don't have a flying car was how much of this book is actually about where is my flying car? Because I was under the impression it was, here's like a particular technology that sounds really interesting that we'd all love to have. Let's explore why technology doesn't evolve. That's what I expected from this book. And that's what I expected from reading this up real life and stuff before you started reading it. But to be honest, this book is actually primarily about where's the flying car, which is fine. All right, cool. I mean, he was honest about it. Where's the flying? That's the title, right? <laughs> it checks out. The most surprising thing about it, in retrospect, is also the most like, does how the regulation killed it how the regulation killed it and then he followed it up with how the deregulation of the aviation industry in the 1970s saved that industry yeah so i did not know that before we read this book that in the so you know you had the development of commercial aviation happening after world war ii from like you know 1950s onwards up to 1970 right um and during that time period it was very much a rich man's game right you only flew anywhere if you were particularly wealthy right because the the cost of the ticket was intense and that became more and more true on into the 1970s because industry instead of getting cheaper and cheaper as they got better and better at it because that's what they were doing right in 1950s they were like i don't know what this hell going on here getting this plane sure we'll go as they got better and better at it you would have thought costs would go lower because they're naturally getting better at managing these flights and that kind of thing but the opposite was occurring because increasing uh, federal um federal aviation re- regulation was really driving cost up for for the commercial airline industry. It's frustrating, but also it makes sense, right? Because when you consider what the role of government is, the role of government is to protect the little person, the regular person. I'm, little, I'm significant, team, Squid. I, I matter. matter. I'm important. It's to protect, protect the little guy, right? From things happening to them outside of his control, that's bad. And your air, your the airplane you go crashing on to go on your honeymoon is something that's pretty shitty, right? Mm-hmm. And so the government yeah, had, a, had a rightful, you know, pull or push would be better phrasing uh, to get after that regulation, um, which makes sense, except the bit where it made fine restrictive, right? And cost too much. Yeah. Uh, and then in the 1970s, people are like, holy shit, okay, flying's becoming untenable at this point. And so they broke up the regulation and deregulated it, re- de- deregulated it substantially and, um, let competition be the major driver outside of i think pure safe like pure pure safety for what was acquired um, from an airline's point of view right um and, and it's, it's ended up doing what there is is did, did what the, to the airline industry what we have now where we have the cheapest like adjusted to inflation flight costs that have ever existed it's weird that we have this mental image in our head that cars and trains are safer because it's like oh it's on the ground like it's not going to fall out it's, there's so much more happening on and, the um, ground he, he gets into that how um yeah. how humans have evolved to to navigate a um a 2d plane as their primary movement axis right um and so that the having the, the 3d movement in a plane is unnatural for folks to like be able to just grasp easily which makes sense right um, so that's probably why we see the um, the ground transportation safer, even though supposedly it's not percentage wise. Um, but anyway, pulling it back into flying cars, uh, the same, same regulation that was strangling the aviation industry um, prevented the flying car industry from ever getting off the ground. <laughs> regulation actually literally killed it, like the uh, the FAA, or the, I guess the the FAA FAA as a baby killed it. Um, I get so frustrated with this because I am a drone pilot and I understand like the regulation that FAA does and to hear him talk about how the FAA literally nixed the flying car because they couldn't handle the traffic made me furious. Well, the funny, the the worst thing about it is it's not even they couldn't handle the traffic because they didn't want to try to handle the traffic. That and that's what makes me so mad. Is this idea that like you are the FAA? This is your job. This is what you do. This is like what you're supposed to be responsible for. And you were just like, ah, eh, we don't want to hire more people. We don't want to have to go through like this. Yeah, this would be a major innovation, to, you know, expansion of humanity. But 
that's just a lot of work. We'd have to figure no, it out. No, but it's worse than that though, man. Because back then, you know, back in like the fifties and sixties and shit, when these when these agencies were just being created, uh, it wasn't. Hey, there's this existing industry that's huge. Like, all right, so imagine like FAA now, right? How much power the FAA has now, right? Purely as like a regulatory thing now. It's like, yeah, if if, if you heard the FAA, FAA was like driving consumer policy, you'd be like, what the fuck, FAA? Like, just tell my planes where they're, where where to land. That's it, right? But like back then, at the at the you know the beginning of this as, as, as aviation industry getting huge and everything, the FAA was like a significant actor in forming the industry, right? So not only were not only were they like picking the direction they wanted to go in by favoring one, they were also shitting other directions for it to go. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the next question. All right, Squid. Out of all of the dreams that this guy kind of painted of you know new technology and futurism, which technological advancement were you most excited for and would you most like to have come to reality? Good question, man. No, no. The first question thing is he's not very specific in general at all, right? So, um, except about the flying car. Except about he's very specific about the flying car, which is very nice. I, I like I like how he does that. He's like very general for a couple of chapters, and then he gets very specific about the flying car. So I respect that. I like the fusion stuff. Yeah, I was. I uh, thought you might. Yeah, I like the fusion power stuff. As a little note, uh, to folks who haven't read the book, um, J. Storrs Storrs Hall is a nanotech expert has been pushing for the adoption of nanotech for years and years and years since like the, the since like 90s i think was when he started working on it. maybe sooner than that so his general ethos his general point about any technology that we lack currently is hey but if we had nanotech we could do it in 10 years uh which is just fun i love how, i love how easy he says that every time he uses it um yeah, I, yeah every time every time there's an issue it's like we could solve this with nanotech if you had nanotech, like, this would be every time it's like we don't really have the uh, the material science capabilities to to uh, support fusion power generation right now, but if we had nanotech, we sure would, and we did get it done in ten years, and this is what we would do with fusion. And it's like a little simple, you know. And so that's the the my, my issue with his point, his discussion about fusion is it's predicated on being supported by nanotechnology. Well, that and the whole f- uh, feeling throughout the book that it was a entrepreneur scientist trying to make the best case possible for his company of nanotech is the future. Nanotech is the way. Nanotech needs the funding. The things that I'm working on are important and stop putting money towards things that I don't think are important. Um, and I feel like all that over and over and over it was nanotech is the solution, which it very well might be, but I, he very glossed over, like, this is how we would do nanotech. There seems to be a jump that he makes every time he comes to nanotech of, I explained it in this one chapter of how nanotech works and could work and is viable, but I'm not really going to explain and say, hey, you know, this, would, this would work, this would be fine. In the author's defense, he does have a book on it separately that's solely about nanotech and how to get it to where it needs to be. And I think his point about the nanotech thing is that no one's given it a serious try. I mean, because, like, intuitively, it does make sense. It's like, okay, build a machine that can build the same machine as itself, just half the size. And then you, let it, you, let, you do that long enough, and you get little teeny shit, little teeny things, making little teeny, teenier things. Maybe I'm wrong. You know what? And I, I you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and just put it out there that I, this, is, this is speculative. But I will say that as you half something, it doesn't become, you know, twice as difficult or even, half, like, to make it. Yeah, it's exponentially more difficult because when you start working at smaller and smaller sizes, you're working with, yeah, and yeah, maybe I just don't have the dream and the vision this guy does, but I I imagine that what he's talking about is essentially alchemy, like changing the very molecular and atomic structure or something. And we've been promised the ability to turn iron into gold for centuries. And it's always been, you know, a hack. And so until there's like a viable example of how this stuff works, I'm just very hesitant and very doubtful. And I'm the reason his stuff doesn't work. I'm the reason his stuff can't get funding because people like me, that are just like, meh, it just seems hokey. It just sounds hokey. Like you're not, you're, and maybe I, I think you're right. I think if I was willing to, reading his book on nanotech might make the difference. Yeah, but I'm not willing to read his book on nanotech. 
if so much of his uh of his tone got through on this one i can only imagine how much through got on his nanotech exclusive book right like yeah um <laughs> I mean, I think it'd be really interesting to see uh, the Nantech stuff. Um, but Fusion was definitely my most interesting technology. The that's fair. Energy is shit. Yeah, that's I, that's where I think we need to make the most advancement, like, is is our process of energy. And with that, my favorite climate control that he talked about of surrounding... The, out, of, out of, like, little teeny um, balloon things. Yeah, the like little teeny, almost like mirror balloon, like essentially climate controlled uh, devices that would be so spread out. Um, I would be worried that you would kind of, yeah, they would be too small to see, but at the same time, like atoms are too small to see. But once you get enough of them, like then we can start to perceive them. I yeah. feel like you would look in, I would be worried that you'd look into the sky and you'd be like, something's just off. Something just isn't quite right. I saw a headline the other day, one of the Reddit pages on like futurism or like space technology or something like that about space billboards, and I cannot imagine more egregious breach of like etiquette than that. Yeah. Oh god, that would be <laughs> awful. Oh, that would be so. But night, so sad. Sorry, excuse me. Like, there's a billboard hanging up there. What? I think Jeez. that would get taken down. Like, not by any government. It would just be. Like, I feel like people would band together and make a rocket and just say, nope. So have you ever um, been uh, seen an ad and you've been like, I hate that ad so much. I'm not going to buy what's what it's trying to sell me. <laughs> I, like, I'm kind of going to. I, I might have liked the product, but I, the, yeah. I hate the fact that that ad is there and I don't want to mm-hmm. support the fact that it is there. So I won't buy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I feel like that would happen on the pretty intense scale if you put a space billboard up. <laughs> Agreed. Moving on, next question, uh, and we're going to actually get into the end of this one. I'm going to keep this video a little short. In your opinion, what invention that he mentioned that you know, about the future and created is the most terrifying to you if it became a reality? Uh, first of all, I love when you ask a question, and it starts with, in my opinion, because I feel like it's just getting ready to hedge some, hedge some stuff. Um, but uh, nanotechnology, really, man. Like, Really? That's what you're most scared of? Yeah, dude. You could eat anything you wanted to eat. Like, literally anything. Like, if you said, okay, I want to remove this city. Oh. Sure. <laughs> create nanotech that turns steel into water. And then next thing you know, a city is just an ocean. Well, I don't, I don't know if we can do that. Because the degree he was talking about wasn't, wasn't like, sub-nuclear. It was just, like, at the atomic scale. But, yeah, or, like, turn it to steel dust at the atomic scale, right? Did you see that movie G.I. Joe? That like most the most recent one? I don't think so, no. Yeah, that's what that was essentially the plot. Oh, yeah, one. with the rockets thing where they shot the rocket at the Apple Tower and ate it with all the corrosive nonsense. Yeah. But yes, was, dude. But it wasn't corrosive. It wasn't corrosive, though it was green. It was weird that they made it green. Uh because, yeah, because it wasn't it was a, corrosive, it was nanotech. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was cool. I did like that. Yeah. That's a, that's kind of exactly what you're talking about. I for, for, I don't we, think that's the most recent G.I. Joe movie. Is it not? Oh, gosh. I bet, I bet they come out with more. Yeah, more they so. probably came out with more. But I, so I thought you meant that you were scared because you said uh, it could eat anything. And I misheard you and thought you said like we could eat anything because he does talk a little bit about the application of you could turn anything into the food that you want. Like it would be readily, readily available. You could structure it into whatever. And so I thought you were like, that scares you because it would be so readily available. All any food you wanted, that <laughs> would be. You have so poor self control, Drake. Come on, man. <laughs> self control. <laughs> Anytime you want, you could eat ice cream, and that's just too much power for what a person to have. Uh, I and I I can see the fear for both those things. Um, my fear would also would be what was also my favorite invention was the climate control, because. The idea that you could harness the energy of the sun uh, at a perfect level and cool any part of the world and heat any part of the world as it is needed is awesome because, you know, it, hey, do we need to heat the world up because our crops can't survive? Do we need to cool it down because it's warm? Incredible. But that also means that in the wrong hands, you could freeze everyone or specifically someone. Just... One country says, you're kind of annoying me. 
winter for 40 years you don't get to you don't get to grow food and he actually even mentioned that how do you ethically ethically run the controls of that kind of thing right and then the follow-on version of that if you remember drake was um a more advanced version of it with focusing ability for like extra mirrors and stuff yeah you could literally make a laser with what the sun that hits the earth right and he was saying you could like blow up a moon with it if you wanted to like what that's terrible that that justice league that is literally the plot of justice league where batman has a laser and that's pointed at earth and everyone gets upset and that's exactly why of who gets to control that kind of power he and, just, i didn't know that that's bad news bad, yeah. bad bad news wait the new one with the the snyder cut and everything oh no 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 this was like uh this was justice league the animated um version. oh well, that's probably more culturally relevant relevant so that was, uh, yeah, that was my the one that I'm most terrified of because I feel like it's, I feel like kind of what you just said, it's so versatile that like, and because the development of it is would be so crucial to our ability to control like, the climate of our little rock, that little spaceship that we call a rock or a rock we call a spaceship or a planet. Um, it would be so critical to it, but at the same time, it would probably be developed with military intent in mind. The only way we can get that kind of funding. That's a little terrifying. Like, whatever country gets it first just gets to say, we decide how the world runs now. We decide what direction. We, we want it to be hot. We want it to be cold. We have the controls. That's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. But that's why the United States has the power they do now, because they did that in the 1940s with the yeah. bomb. Roy Jasper makes a good point. I won't say your real name because we're live, but good to see you, my friend. Roy Jasper makes a good point. Isn't that the problem with all big technological development? Can't let fear stop development, only prepare for it. But- Thank you so much for saying that, Mr. Jasper. Jeez Louise. Because that's something I want to discuss here before we get off this book, Drake. Yes. Um, is that, so this guy has tons of points that I think are very personal to him that definitely took a tone that was overly personal, personal for the uh, kind of book he's writing here. But he has tons of other points that I really like and resonate with that are true, and I wish weren't in a book with other things that really dilute the, the effectiveness of them. And his point that I like the most is humans' fear of high, higher energy technology, right? Because like Mr. Jasper is saying there, the higher the energy the, of technology, the more risky it is in terms of if it's used poorly, right? Yeah. Not even even assuming it works and doesn't break, right? The risk of a, of a high energy technology, you know, breaking down something tragic happening literally from it breaking is higher. Let alone the issue of like if it's run from an unethical point of view and that kind of stuff, right? Um, which is really really accurate. But his point here is that if we're too afraid of it for too long, we literally just deny ourselves a significant chunk of what humans can achieve as a society functioning as a species right i can't begin to guess how like you know that should be the the prime the prime management approach to that kind of thing right but if you i mean i feel like if you just give up on those technologies because like yeah that's that's gonna be a complicated issue to, to solve then you're really missing out on a lot of function like so of you know what you could get like because well, them we, the get, here, we get right? scared we get scared really easily not easily but i mean look at chernobyl chernobyl had this like massive problem and we've been terrified of nuclear energy ever since it's taken us decades to even start to get back to it even though they've 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 prepped for it they've prepared for it they've made the plants safer and like where that won't happen again and it's still section people, and, um, and uh, traumatic about it. go ahead do you remember the section on fukushima here in this book so about how the radiation leak from the fukushima nuclear reactor React, um, reactor thing to the surrounding area was as high as the background radiation in Norway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But all it took, all it took was us Excuse getting scared. Me? All it took was like... us getting scared. <laughs> like we're just scared of high energy because yeah, we've made huge advancements in personal computer technology and telecommunication. You can't really destroy a city with a cell phone but i will say like even look at how the telecommunication like the advancements of telecommunication technology have caused problems you know what i mean like with with we can now communicate on such a global scale and misinformation has become this huge ethical problem 
we're not good at dealing with like advancing technology and coming up with regulations and how we should behave. Like we don't, we're not very good at scaling our ethics with our technology, which is really inconvenient. But it's like, so it's very funny that we got back around to the regulation thing because earlier in the discussion, we were talking about, yeah, regulation is really strangling all these industries, right? But it's like, okay, well, what do you do? Do you overly regulate it so that it doesn't end up as in some kind of dystopia? Or like, how do you hit that sweet spot where you regulate it enough so you don't have like vast percentage of the population being taken advantage of, but you still get to figure out these technologies? Yeah. It's a hard question. It is a hard question, and it is one we will leave up to our wonderful viewers to ponder and leave comments and discuss below. For now, we're going to wrap up our discussion of Where's My Flying Car? I did not enjoy this book. It was ruined by a tone that could have been a lot more positive and a lot more focused on the positives, but chose to focus on all the negatives, and it was a really disappointing approach because he really did an incredible job at sourcing both science fiction to talk about the, the future we were promised and the actual real life implications. So I feel like if you just focused on the positive and not as much on the negative, that we really could have come out with a, a, a much better book. But me personally, I did not enjoy it. Um, Squid, why don't you uh, give us a couple last words and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, um, I agree with you, Drake. Uh, it is a chance to be a really good book, spoiled by his, his approach to it, right? Um, I think I think the best way to sum it up is it literally it, it's it reads exactly like a disgruntled college professor who got his funding pulled went to write a book instead like like literally it reads like a guy a, a science a science prof- a, a um, really cool like top of the line researcher was writing a book he was writing for twenty years doing a bunch of research to write it right he had all this good data and then his funding got pulled eighteen months before he finished the book when he had to tie it together and put all the connecting paragraphs in. And this is what the result is. <laughs> like, that's what it feels like to me. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed our analysis and thoughts on Where's My Flying Car by J. Story Hall. Um, if you have any opinions on this book, if you've read it, or just on what we've spoken about today, please leave it in the comments down below. While you're there, give us a like. And if you like the content, please go ahead and subscribe. We do our, host a live book club on the final Saturday of every month. That is over on Twitch twitch.tv backslash drac underscore ob or dracob and i would love to have you there live i do my best to respond in the chat while people are here and uh then we post these every uh usually about every other week so stay tuned and we'll keep taking you behind the cover in between the lines of your favorite books until next time this is drake with squid from the deep inky depths key signing off